Good morning and welcome to Real Divorce Talk San Diego. We're happy to be here with you guys today. My name is Lynn Waldman. I am a divorce coach and therapist and you can find my website at divorcecounselingcenter.com. And these are my co-hosts, Sean Skillen, family law attorney. And Sean's website is seanskillenlaw.com. And Mark Hill, certified divorce financial analyst. And Mark's website is packdivorce.com. And all three of us are members of Collaborative Family Law Group San Diego. And we have a workshop coming up Saturday, April 6th. The first Saturday of every month we have a workshop talking about divorce, hence the name Divorce Options. And you can find out how you can get through the process. It's a three hour workshop. So please check out that website at collaborativefamilylawsandiego.com or you can call 858-472-4022. Now feel free to write in with questions. We love questions from you guys. We, are, we want to be challenged with any questions you have about divorce. And our show today is divorce, moving on. So you've divorced, you're getting through the process, going through the process, and we wanna look at what your future may look like and what you have to consider. So, um, Sean and Mark, what are some legal and financial aspects that people might want to consider um, as they are moving on and moving through the divorce process? And maybe for some of our clients, things have calmed down a little bit. What do they still need to consider and think about? Okay, from a legal standpoint, look at your marital settlement agreement or the judgment that you got from the court if you had a trial and go through that kind of paragraph by paragraph and make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Things like changing the titles on the car, changing the beneficiaries on your health insurance or not your health insurance, your life insurance, um, your retirement plans. You're dividing up your bank accounts. You're finishing up the qualified domestic relations orders to divide your retirement plans. There's a lot of little nitpicky details that are in that marital settlement agreement that just need to be followed up on. It's not necessarily crucial that it be done tomorrow, but it should be done in fairly short order, especially things like retirement plans. People tend to kind of get that agreement signed or get through the trial and then take a big sigh of relief and then try to relax for a while. And there's just some things that you really do need to kind of tidy up. So go through that paragraph by paragraph and just take care of the things that are, that are in there. Also, don't forget to do a new will and a trust. So your marital settlement agreement, if you had a family trust, terminated your family trust. And so now that you're single again or almost single again, you need to go to uh, an estate planning attorney and get your, your affairs in order in that way. Sean, what would happen if um, the, your, your ex-spouse now isn't cooperative? How much cooperation do you need to get all that stuff taken care of? Well, some things you just need to take the marital settlement agreement down to the bank or to the place that holds your retirement account or things like that. And sometimes they'll ask for a certified copy and you can get a certified copy from the clerk at the court if your lawyer didn't already do that to you for $25, I think. Um, and they'll usually make a copy of certain pages and then you can fill out things and sign stuff yourself. If it requires your spouse's signature and they're not being cooperative, they probably have things that they need you to sign off on too. So just say, hey, I need to sign off on this for you. Why don't we get together and you sign mine, I'll sign yours, blah, blah, blah. If that doesn't work, then you need to contact your attorney and then have them write a letter. Um, to the other attorney, to your spouse, saying, hey, you need to sign off on this. If that's not successful, you can actually go to court and say, you know, my ex isn't signing off on the car title, my ex isn't signing off on the retirement, and they can appoint the clerk to be what they call an elizer, and that means that the court clerk will sign in place of your spouse as an order, and that that court order is signed by the clerk and the judge will then go to the bank or the retirement or whatever. Um, so there's, there's ways of kind of escalating um, the issue so that eventually it gets taken care of in the court. And if you have to go to court to have an ELISA appointed to sign a document, 
ask for your ex to pay your attorney's fees that you incurred in having to do that, and that will usually be granted. So, of course, as usual, cooperation really goes a long way in resolving these issues and not having that extra added stress of getting things taken care of. Yeah, I mean, getting through a divorce and being as cooperative as possible, whether it's dividing up the stuff, signing the documents, will just, it'll totally save you a ton of stress, a ton of time, and a ton of money. So as hard as the feelings might be, as raw as the feelings might be, as challenging as they might be, really try and look at it as a, a business thing that you have to take care of, a bunch of tasks that have to be done in this business of divorce, and just get them done. And you'll get through it faster and with less stress and less cost. And so, Mark, financially, what do you think, what should people be thinking about or considering going forward? You need to reorder your financial life completely because everything's changed um, uh, from the standpoint of budgets. What is your budget going to look like? Have you done a budget? What can you afford? Um, you probably already have a new residence, but have you gotten to the point where you fully understand what the full expenses are for that residence, what your monthly costs are going to be? How are you going to handle, if you have children, the finances for the children? Are you and your spouse just going to transfer checks based upon which way the, uh, the support is going? Uh, are you going to establish a separate account where you might pay children expenses from? Um, how is that all going to work? Uh, additionally, long-term planning is really important because many people come out of divorce going, my Lord, will I ever be able to actually retire? Well, there's an old saying in my business, nobody ever plans to fail, they just fail to plan. And sitting down with your advisor and planning out how these new financial circumstances are going to impact you can be empowering. It can be scary, but usually it's not as scary as not doing it and fearing it, uh, in my experience. So, and I talk from personal as well as professional, having been through this uh, myself more than once. Um, the other thing Me is, too. other thing is relationships. Um, do you have a relationship with an accountant? Or is the relationship with your spouse? Are you comfortable in still working with that same person? Same thing with the financial advisor you may be working with. Do you feel more comfortable with a new financial advisor? How are you going to find one that's trustworthy? Um, all of these questions should be addressed. And um, as Sean said, you get through divorce and you go, ah, oh, it's over. I can relax now. From stand well, some standpoints, you certainly can relax, but there are also issues that if you don't address them, will come back to bite you later. So that is a good question. Like, how would somebody go about finding a financial advisor they trust? How, how do you do that? Uh, um, I think you want somebody who's credentialed. In other words, somebody who uh, has a, a, a license that can be revoked and removed. Um, now, most people will have what's called a Series 7 license that could be revoked, but there again, there's uh, a, a very large number of people who hold that designation, and the enforcement is not always as uh, intense as perhaps one would like it to be. Um, someone who has a certified financial planner designation, as I do, um, has been through an extensive course um, that covers taxes, investments, estate planning, retirement planning and investment management. Um, and so at least you know somebody who's well grounded. Also, they have a very uh, precise ethical standards that have to be followed. Um, so look for someone who's a CFP. Talk to people who are friends. Find out you know, mm -hmm. if they've had an advisor for many years that they trust and has done well for them. And I don't mean just made them a lot of money. I mean uh, looked out for their best interests at, at, at every point of the, uh, of the relationship. Um, I think that's probably the best place to start. And I'm also curious, when couples do go through divorce, you know, clearly they're splitting resources and one home is now two. <laughs> How long typically, and I don't know if there is a typical, that it takes for somebody to kind of get back on their feet financially? 
I, I think it takes five years. Mm -hmm. That was my experience, and I always thought I could do it in two. Uh, my experience was I couldn't. <laughs> but by five years, I was pretty much, uh, I think, back on my feet. Um, so I think somewhere between two and five years is a reasonable amount. I think it's unreasonable to think that divorce won't have an impact on your lifestyle. And I think that's part of the problem we sometimes have with couples who uh, read that one part, Sean, mm -hmm. of the uh, of the, of the code that Standard says I'm, of living during the marriage. I'm entitled to yeah. it, right? And they don't read the next part that says if it's available. Um, it doesn't, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it says that that's one consideration. Right, yeah. And what the judges here in San Diego always remind us at our meeting is that they're usually reminding both sides that they're not going to enjoy the same standard of living yeah. after the divorce as they did during their marriage. So I, a lot of adjustments need to be made for both spouses and for the kids. Mm -hmm. And I know we talk a lot about uh, not bringing the kids into the divorce and things like that, but the reality is that the kids may have to make adjustments too. And I don't think we do our kids any favors if we, if we try and give them everything um, that they want and don't help them understand the reality of of money. I mean, I remember when my kids were little and you'd go to the bank, you know, drive up, tell her, and you'd stick the ATM card in and cash <laughs> came out of the machine and they thought that was magic. <laughs> and they just wanted to know why we couldn't just get more money. And I said, because money only comes out of the machine if you put money into the bank at some point <laughs> and you can only get as much money out as you have in your account at the bank. And so I had explained that a few yeah. times. Um, but they I, all know, I, I know to how the to same, budget. The same with my so. son, it was with a credit card. I don't have the money for that. Oh, well, just use a credit card. Yeah. Let me explain how that works. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for me, that comes down to values in how you explain the value of money to your yeah. kid. Yeah. And it also comes down to values about who you are, how you define yourself, how you want to live your life. Um, I've noticed that sometimes, you know, out of guilt, parents mm -hmm. don't talk to kids about that or they want them to think that don't worry I'm gonna always take care of you you'll be fine and then the kids miss out on learning about the value of money I can live in, under an underpass but the children must still have their private school right. and their riding lessons yes right? no, and I yeah. see that happen all the yeah. time and I think that I know you're you're the mental health specialist yes. on this panel so how do you talk to your children about the divorce about the change in finances and that there may be some cutting back I mean we went through a big recession 10 years ago or so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and my kids came home and said did you know so-and-so lost their house when they had to move in with grandparents and my wow. kids were panicked and they said you know are we gonna lose our house and I said you know no I said you know my husband at the time and I had kind of recession proof jobs and I said, but you know, we, we can grow food in the yard. We're not gonna starve, <laughs> we're not gonna, you know, because we garden. Um, so there, you know, nobody's gonna starve, we're not gonna lose our house. But they were seeing it happen to their friends. Mm -hmm. And so we have, ever since I've been practicing mm -hmm. family law, which is, you know, 24 years now, there's always been this mantra of don't tell the kids, don't tell the kids, don't tell the kids. I've kind of come over the years to think that that's not necessarily accurate. Do you want to involve them in, did dad have an affair? Did mom have an affair? You know, all that kind of stuff. No, mm -hmm. probably not, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're little. But then right. what do you, you know, what is fair and how do you approach the kids on things like finances and co-parenting or when one parent has a substance abuse problem? I right. mean, there are things that the kids have to learn. Yes, completely. I, I agree with that. And I think that, of course, you're going to have to keep it appropriate to the age of the child. You're not going to tell little kids. And, and, you know, mom and dad's interpersonal relationship and who had an affair, all of that does not really need to be told to the kids. It's hurtful information. I don't see how it's beneficial to the family or to the family dynamics. But again, it goes back to knowing your values what makes up who you are it's about your sense of self and because divorce is trauma because it changes your identity that through this process what i like to do as a mental health professional is help clients re-establish who am i um, how do i identify myself how do i want to live my life like what values are important to me integrity honesty being fair sticking to my values not over apologizing and when it comes to finances, I think it's important for kids to know that 
There's not always going to be an easy flow of money mm -hmm. as there has been. And, um, you know, what, what is it going to take for you as you grow to be able to support yourself? And maybe that's why school is important, sticking with education. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are also values that parents can teach to their kids because it's not just about money and things. It's, it's much right. deeper than that. You know, my personal story is that I grew up with a father who was an entrepreneur and very mercurial. Um, ended up, uh, he was in the real estate business and other businesses, but uh, a couple times basically projects went bankrupt. And I went from having the largest allowance of any kid in my class to zero <laughs> allowance. And, uh, you know, it was okay. I mean, because the family stayed together. I yeah. learned that if you, it actually it probably helped me become a little bit of a risk taker in my own personal life because I saw that you could take risks. Sometimes it will work, sometimes it wouldn't, but the family survived and we were a cohesive unit and we pulled together when the need came. And actually, I, I see it as a, a benefit having experienced that. So it actually maybe gave you some independence and taught you about being yeah. independent and how to take care of yourself. Yes. Yeah, Very that's much so. really yeah. important. Yeah. I think the other thing I always say to parents is to don't change a bunch of stuff with the kids. I mean, there's there's a big change going on because you're divorced and your family structure has changed. And they might be living in two new houses or one new house and the same old house. Uh, but don't change their responsibilities. Don't change their bedtimes. Don't change the expectations mm -hmm. that they will get up and go to school every day and then do their homework and go to soccer practice or baseball or whatever it is that they do, music lessons. Um, because those kind of things staying consistent give kids a lot of security. The other mistake I think that parents make is they do feel so guilty about putting their kids through a divorce that all of a sudden they're giving them all kinds of things. And it may not be big things, but it's like you go to the store and the kid says, Dad, can I have a stick snicker bar? And normally you would say no because you're going to have dinner in half an hour and you say yes because you feel bad. They, they will figure out that pulling on the heartstrings and tugging on the guilt chain, you know, mm -hmm. really works. And they'll work it for as long as you let them get away with it. And when you do that, then, you know, kind of the kids start running the household and it becomes hard to reverse mm -hmm. it. So stick to the rules that you've always cared about with your children. And it's okay if there's rules one set of rules in mom's house and one set of rules in dad's house or whoever the other parent but is. But the more you can coordinate that, I think the better. I mean, mm -hmm. children have this ability to triangulate, right? Yes, <laughs> right. You know, Absolutely. and so um, dad doesn't say yes, maybe mom will, you know. Right. So again, or they'll get how did you deal with that as a couple and yes. how can you yeah. continue that so you create a united front so the children have some stability? Right, yeah. right. So, but it's one thing like if it's okay to eat cereal at mom's house, it's yeah, not okay yeah, yeah, to eat cereal. Yeah, I get it. Those things yeah. are fine. Kids <laughs> adapt, right? They have different right. rules at Sunday school than they do at school, than they yep. do at soccer practice, than they do at home. Uh, bedtimes being consistent, especially mm -hmm. for younger kids, is really important so that they can get up and get to school or wherever they need to go in both houses. And discipline um, either needs to occur in your house when something goes wrong and not overflow into the other parent's house because if they don't back you up then you know you kind of lose credibility or if something serious goes on with your kid and you need to put them on restriction for the rest of their life <laughs> you need to have a discussion with the other parent and make sure they're on board so that yeah. the, the discipline can carry through to both households or again you have one kid saying dad come get me because mom's being so mean and don't do that either if, yeah. if they get in trouble at mom's house they stay at mom's house and deal with mom right. if they get in trouble at dad's house they stay at dad's house and deal with dad don't don't try and rescue them because again you'll undermine each other's credibility and power as parents and you'll have a difficult time dealing with your teenagers when they get there exactly and you know really having that kind of unified parental unit even mm -hmm. if you're not together anymore um, for example, like you might have a three or four year old that wakes up in the middle of the night. If mom and dad can both handle that the same way, helping their child get back to sleep and not go to sleep in their bed, like if they can have similar... Yeah, either um, you both have a family bed or you don't. Right, 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 right. And then it keeps the kids from aligning with one parent or the other and keeping away from that triangulation. Lynn, I have a friend of mine, a psychologist, who some years ago told me that if children, little children, have an intrinsic understanding that they shouldn't be in control, 
And if they do gain control with a parent, it can actually be scary to them. Absolutely. Is that, is that true? I think that's yeah. true. Yeah. I think it's damaging. It takes them out of being a child, and then mm -hmm. they're in the role. They become parentified, and they're taking care of that parent. Or they become very aligned with that parent, mm -hmm. sometimes against the other parent. I've seen it used um, for guilt. Mm -hmm. uh, if mom's aligned with the child and dad feels guilty for having left or leaving, leaving the family, um, they'll use that guilt for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it does create kind of this unfortunate alliance where that child really never gets to become independent and support mm -hmm. themselves. And, and in one of the cases that I know of, the teenage daughter was a master manipulator with mother. Mm -hmm. um, and got what she wanted, but also expressed that she felt abandoned by her mother because her mother never took that role mm. of the parent. Yep. Yep. And that it, w it was scary for her. Yeah. And yeah. so they milk the parent for the guilt for all it's worth, but mm -hmm. resent the parent at the same time for not <laughs> exactly. setting boundaries mm -hmm. and lose respect for the parent because they didn't. And so it can really backfire on the parent who is, is trying to be uh, you know, more generous in a way right. with and be their friend without setting limits and not yeah. taking the role of the parent. I mean, teenagers are going through this thing where they feel like they're 30 on one hand mm -hmm. and then at the other time they still feel like they're five. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to, there still need to be some boundaries and, and limits. Well, in fact, I recently spoke with a family friend who must be, I don't know, 34 years old, and she was telling me how there's been all these abandonment issues with her parent and you know, using those issues to still expect to be financially supported, mm. and you know, not having been healed or been able to move on from those real or perceived, you know, I don't know, abandonment issues, and it hasn't been healthy for her or her family. You know, it's it mm -hmm. keeps her from becoming truly independent in her own person. Yeah, rules, boundaries, consistency with yeah. kids makes them feel safe. Absolutely. Um, and they can, you know, they like I said, they'll see different sets of rules at mom's house, dad's house, friend's house, schools, whatever. And when they grow up, they can decide what they like. But they know where the limits are. They know what to expect. And it does make them feel safe and gives them a place where they can build their own confidence. And you know, that kind of brings me to something we had talked about before the show is a mission statement. Because I know when we, we have a collaborative case and we're ha helping a couple get through divorce collaboratively, one of the first things we do is come up with a mission statement. How do you want to see your family get through this divorce? What are your end goals? How do you want to proceed as co-parents? What are your values? What matters to you? And if parents can really get on the same page with a mission statement, I feel like it's such a powerful tool that they can come back to this when they feel that they're veering away. Um, I would love to know how you guys have seen mission statements in collaborative or with your own work and how it's worked for you and, and the families you work with. I think the, the, that it's important to identify the values that the clients want to incorporate into their settlement. And sometimes a formal mission statement can sometimes feel a little bit sort of intrusive, I think, to some clients. But talking about, and uh, I, trust me, I love it if we can actually get to that point, but I have had resistance from clients. I'm like, mission statement, I'm not a corporation. I've had that sent to me, you know. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, but, but again, um, well, what values do you want to incorporate into this settlement? How, how do you want your relationship to be with your spouse after the divorce? Um, how, how, how do you feel you would like to have those interactions be? Mm -hmm. And if you can get people focusing on that, then you come up with concepts and then you can turn it into a mission statement or a, not quite be so formal, but come back to it and say, this is, sir, what you told me in our first meeting that you wanted to do. Do you yeah. feel we're doing that at this point? You know, so it gives you that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I'll kind of go about it by talking about goals because I think mission statement for some people is if they're not in business and they haven't created one, it's kind of this thing that they don't know what to do with. And what's funny is in my mediations is most of the time at the beginning people are focused on their fears. You know, so they're fearful that they're not going to have money. They're fearful that they're not going to have a nice place to live. They're feel fearful that their children are going to be negatively impacted by the divorce. And so sometimes in letting them talk about their fears, I can turn them around into their goals are to be financially independent, to have their children do well with the divorce and be able to thrive and to learn. 
And usually if you have a couple that have children, one of their main goals is that you can incorporate into a mission statement or whatever you want to call it is that their children will do well. And so if you can get them to articulate that in some way or help articulate it with them, then you can keep coming back to that. And so I'll talk about it in terms of connection a lot of times. How connected do you want to be in terms of your parenting? How connected do you want to be in terms of your finances and in other aspects of your life? Like does dad, is dad still, well I have a, a good friend who's been divorced now for probably 10 years and her husband will still come over and fix stuff. Um, she recently went through a cancer scare and her husband was there with her kids, you know, when she was going through chemo and surgery and all of those kind of things. So they're still very connected even though they're divorced, you know, for many years and they've moved on. And so for a lot of people it's, it's looking at what kind of connections and relationships you want to maintain after the divorce and how do we go through this process in a way that will allow you to do that. You can't be very well connected as co-parents if you're slugging it out through the divorce and talking about how bad you each are. So, um, so when we talk about moving on, it's not only the legal and the financial, it's, you know, it's a reformation of the family, yep. basically. Um, and, and you always say in divorce options, you always say, what kind of story do you want mm -hmm. your kids to tell mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 years down the yes. line? And I think for parents, that's a really good thing to ask them. Yeah. What, when they look back on the divorce, what kind of story do you want them to be telling their friends, their spouse, their own children, your grandchildren, um, down the line? Yes, and they can take that mission statement with them all the way down the line. So, so Mark, what about taxes? What do we need to know about taxes? Because tax season is upon us, right. moving on. So if you're recently divorced and, and <coughs> you were filing as a married, um, <coughs> excuse me, as a married couple, um, your marital status on the last day of the year dictates what your tax filing status is. So when was your divorce final? If it was final in 2018, guess what? You're filing as a single individual. Um, if you're filing after that, you will be filing um, by prior to that, pardon me, as married or as married filing singly, which is actually the highest one and to be avoided, the highest tax bracket. Um, so yeah. thinking through that and seeing that your withholdings are correct, because these numbers have changed dramatically and with the new tax law, that means that any divorces that were final after the end of last year without a decree that says to otherwise, uh, essentially are now no longer the, the, the payor, the person writing the check, doesn't get a tax deduction for that. For and spousal it's not support. For spousal support, yeah. correct. Uh, child support hasn't changed. But for spousal support, the issue is that you now have less money to go around. But what does that mean to your, for your withholdings? Are you withholding at the right levels? And that's something you probably should be talking to your accountant as you're talking about doing last year's taxes, so you're set up and you're not going to be faced with a big bill next year because you've underwithheld. And there's a lot of rules that changed. I mean, first of all, with the new Tax Cut Job Act from a couple years ago, a lot of people that I know, clients and friends, are filing taxes this year and finding that they owe a lot more money than they yeah. thought. So you need to reevaluate your tax status anyway, your withholding allowances, all those kind of things, and get those changed so you don't get a big tax bill. But also, how long you can claim your children as an exemption, even though technically they're not an exemption, there's a credit for it. Those rules have changed. I think it's through the age of 16 now or to the age of 16. I always get that one confused. But it, it's no longer until they're 23. So there's a lot of things that have changed with you know what you can claim on your taxes. Again, go back to your marital settlement agreement or your judgment from the court and look at who's supposed to to claim which child on their taxes. Is it every year? Is it in odd years? Is it even years? Because the IRS takes care, t tracks all that stuff on their computers by social security number and they will find those kind of discrepancies right away if you both claim the same child and then somebody's going to get hit with another tax bill. Mm -hmm. Another thing too we haven't talked about regarding finances is the management of the assets and the risk profile. In other words, how much risk you're taking in that portfolio, how much is allocated to stocks, how much to bonds, how much to cash, how much to alternative investments. And that many people sort of set it and forget it. 
They just literally set their allocation and years go by. And as we approach retirement, we should look at the question of whether we're taking too much risk. Are we taking the kind of risk that was appropriate when we were 40 with 25 years to go? Now we're late 50s and we've got less than a decade before we're going to have to turn these funds into a paycheck. Volatility in markets is something that will always exist. Um, we've had a very long bull run in stocks. I'm not saying it can't continue, but trees do not grow to the sky. And eventually it, we will get a, a serious decline in these markets. Um, are you correctly positioned? Have you changed that allocation to risk based upon your new budget, your new circumstances? People don't always look at that and then something occurs in the markets and suddenly they're looking at the prospect of working for more years because they were taking on too much risk at that time. It's, you know, I think that sometimes this can sound so overwhelming because there's so much to think about. Mm -hmm. I, I really wonder how do people manage with so much information out there and... I think having a quarterback is really important. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody, a trusted advisor, be it a lawyer, be it an accountant, be a financial person, who you can go to and feel confident that A, they're going to only advise you on things that they are qualified to do so and will refer out where necessary. And as I said before, have your best interests at heart. And I think that that's a, a good point, Lynn. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that change in divorce. It is overwhelming. There's mm -hmm. so much stuff that you need to do, whether it's you know getting moved and getting settled, changing the car titles, doing the taxes, figuring out how to invest on your own, do your own budget for the first time. Just keep plodding away. The worst thing that you can do is bury your head in the sand and ignore it all. So have a list. You've got a list in a way in that marital settlement agreement again, and just have that list. And if you can only deal with one thing a week or one thing every two weeks, just keep working away at it. Um, and then you'll, you'll get there eventually. And I have so many clients, usually women, who have never dealt with the finances, have never dealt with buying their own car. They don't know what the, t the pink slip is mm -hmm. for the car or what the title is. And s I've had some have to hire somebody to go down to the bank with them to open their accounts, to move things over, to just to get that done because they're so overwhelmed by the paperwork. But as they plod along at it, they really build this confidence. And they mm -hmm. do learn and they do realize it's not that hard. So just keep picking away at it one little thing at a time and you will get it done and you'll feel much better about it and you'll figure it out. And you know, I would say from the mental health perspective, it is about self-care, that you do have to have that balance, that you do want to focus on self-care, whatever that means for you, and at the same time, still having this list, like you say, and just keep, you know, plodding away. And if you're overwhelmed with emotion, you know, notice the emotion, notice where you feel it. And I'm sure I've mentioned this before on the show, but we have a saying, name it to tame it. If you can become aware of that emotion, say it out loud, notice where you might feel it physically, it has a way of moving through us like waves in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So we want to think about riding that wave of emotion until you can be effective. And it can be empowering. Mm -hmm. It really can. I have seen, um, as you say, Sean, usually ladies who are coming in who have not been, they've raised sometimes a large number of children and allowed their finances to be handled by their spouse. And as they gradually, as you point out, Lynn, as they gradually accomplish these tasks, the confidence level goes up and eventually it can be empowering. And mm -hmm. um, it, it's something that uh, people don't anticipate. It's really a surprise. Yes. But, it, but it happens and yeah. it's the most rewarding thing for me as a divorce mm -hmm. professional to see. Um, the, usually it's the, the wife that gets more accomplished in managing the financial and technical day-to-day -day stuff of, uh, of the thing. And for dads, yeah. it's becoming a better parent. Um, you know, dads have a really hard time for that first six, eight, 12 months figuring out how do I go to work and manage the kids. You know, get them to soccer, get dinner on the table, go to the grocery store, get their homework done, get them bathed, get them put to bed. 
each person kind of realizes that the other person, even though they didn't like being married to him, <laughs> did stuff, did stuff <laughs> yeah. um, that they maybe didn't get credit for. And now they have to do all of that stuff on their own, the stuff they always did plus what the other person did. And so for, for women, it's often overwhelming learning the finances. For dads, it's, it's getting the parenting routine down. But they do. And they figure it out, and they they get better at it, and they have that confidence that grows, and they usually mm -hmm. really find that they like having this relationship with their mm -hmm. kids that they get to make into whatever they want, and not the way their wife told them that they had to read the story or put on the pajamas <laughs> or do the baths. So it's it's happen? very <laughs> it's very rewarding for both parties. Um, but give you but be nice to yourself, like Lynn said, you know, self care. Uh, take a break now and then. Go for a walk. Have a nice glass of wine. Not too many. Um, <laughs> because it is, it is a difficult transition. And so just go with it and it really does get better. Yes. So what would be some final thoughts about moving on? What would you like clients to know or tools they could take with them? Make a list. Make a list, mm -hmm. and as you accomplish, as don't be panicked by how long it is, but as you accomplish things, cross them off, and that's where the accomplishment will start to, you know, be felt by you. So I would say, just quantify what you have to do and what's important. Um, take take the first month off; it's okay. Take a deep breath; yeah. no problem with that. But but don't be sort of 12, 18, two years down the road going, I really should look at all that stuff. Um, I'm going to tell a horror story, if I can. Oh, please. From my investment past. I had a client who worked for, um, both clients, second marriage, they worked for a major airline that was based in San Diego, and then it got bought and uh, they moved to Pittsburgh. Um, unexpectedly, he died. Mm. Okay. Um, about three months later, unexpectedly, she died. Wow. Uh, there were two IRAs. His was much larger than hers. They each named their spouse as beneficiary. But what had happened was they didn't change those beneficiaries. And so what happened was he died, money went to her account, she died, it all went to her children. His kids got nothing. Mm -hmm. So again, if you don't do this beneficiary stuff, it can end up with situations that are totally unexpected. Um, so that was not the intent, by the way, <laughs> of either of them, mm -hmm. but that's how the mechanics work, just because the client didn't change beneficiaries. And so you face the same thing in divorce. Yeah. And, and not expecting that unexpected tragedy. Right, exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And, th and that happens when you don't get the retirement stuff straightened out. You don't get right. the quadros filed and yeah. the IRA is divided and the 401ks and one of you gets remarried and goes down and changes the beneficiary to the new spouse and then that person dies and all the money goes to the new spouse and the first spouse didn't get their share of the retirement and then you have a big mess that you're trying to clean up. So it, it is important to carry through and use that MSA as a list, but again, just plod along with it. Um, and I guess I would say um, be kind to yourself, be patient with yourself, um, and, and just keep moving along and do have confidence that things will get better but be patient because it does take time. And, and I would say that there will be a silver lining that, uh, like we mentioned earlier, divorce is trauma and you will get through it and you'll find things out about yourself you had no idea about that you could do, no clue, and you're going to be a stronger person for it. Um, it's difficult and you will get through it and I would say that if you have questions, you definitely want to consult professionals who can help answer your questions um, because knowledge is power and it's, it's reassuring when you have the right answers. And that brings me to reminding folks that we do have our Divorce Options Workshop. It is April 6th. It's the first Saturday of every month from 9 to noon in Carmel Valley. And we will have a family law attorney, divorce financial analyst and a mental health person such as myself, a divorce coach, there to answer all questions because divorce is legal, financial, and it's emotional. Mm -hmm. It's a great workshop. Um, and if you are interested, please check out our website, collaborativefamilylawsandiego.com, or give us a call, 
858-472-4022. We would love to have you at our workshop. And if you would like more information, Sean Skillen, her website is seanskillenlaw.com. Please reach out to her. And Mark Hill, Certified Divorce Financial Analyst at packdivorce.com. And you can find me, Lynn Waldman, at divorcecounselingcenter.com. Um, any final messages for our viewers today? Process, not an event. Yes. It's a process, not an event. And it takes a little time, but um, if you focus on it, you will empower yourself throughout it. Great words of wisdom. <laughs> I have nothing more to add. <laughs>